Straight ahead, all Law & Crime Daily. The defense team of Robert Durst files an emergency and indefinite stay of trial. Why attorneys say the millionaire real estate heir accused of murdering his best friend is physically incompetent to stand trial. We speak to a juror in the trial of a convicted wife killer, Scott Peterson, about a possible retrial. What he has to say about allegations of stealth juror tainted deliberations. My mind hasn't changed one bit. And what to expect for the upcoming Iowa trial of a man accused of killing a college student and hiding her body in a cornfield. Plus, a former Florida deputy on trial for allegations of planting drugs on unsuspecting motorists takes a stand in his own defense. Zachary Wester's explanation for drugs found in his own patrol car. I was processing evidence from a call. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. Attorneys for a millionaire real estate heir charged in the murder of his best friend are asking for an emergency stay in his trial, which is set to resume next week. The evidence will show demonstrating that she was unafraid, she wasn't scared, she didn't know what was going to happen, and then she was executed. Robert Durst's trial in the death of a longtime friend, Susan Berman, began last year and was halted amid the pandemic. Over three days, Prosecutor John Lewin argued in opening statements that Berman's death in 2000 had a direct link to the disappearance of Robert Durst's wife, Kathleen Durst, in 1982, and used the death of his neighbor, Morris Black, in 2001 to tie all three incidents together. Susan Berman, huh? although loyal, was not the best at keeping secrets. But Robert Durst's defense team denies he had anything to do with his wife's disappearance or Susan Berman's murder. The entire case is premised on a false assumption and a false presentation. Not only is there evidence which completely belies the prosecution's case, but you will see they have no evidence as how to how this alleged murder of Kathy Durst ever occurred. Bob Durst did not kill Susan Berman, and he doesn't know who did. Durst's attorneys say their client wants to take the stand at his trial but his bladder cancer and other health conditions make him physically incompetent to proceed. Attorney David Chesnoff and his team filed this emergency motion to continue the trial. The judge is expected to hear their arguments on Monday. Joining us today is former federal prosecutor Gene Rossi and Terry Austin. Gene, the judge needs to balance the jury being out for 14 months and a request for an indefinite delay due to Durst's competency. How do you see the judge ruling here? I think the judge is gonna continue the trial I had a doctor, a pain doctor, who had a medical issue very serious, and the judge uh, continued it for two or three months, but it was an illness that was much less serious than bladder cancer. And the other thing is this, Mr. Dirtz is set almost 79 years old, and just look at that photo or the, the video right there. He doesn't look well, and I think the judge is going to continue it, definitely. Yeah. Now, Terry, the defense wants Durst released to a medical facility where Durst can get treatment. Uh, kind of seems like a like a compromise here. Do you think the judge may rule that way? Listen, I think that would be a great compromise, Brian. I hope they're listening to you. This case needs to go to trial. Like Gene said, Durst is 78 years old, and he does have a medical condition, but this case has been going on. This occurred in 2000 when he allegedly killed Susan Berman, which it seems that evidence is pointing in that direction. So I think they should figure out a way to have this case actually be tried so that we can have some justice, even though this justice is clearly delayed. Yeah, I don't think the judge is really going to like this concept of it being an indefinite delay. If there was some sort of time period, maybe, but I think it's going to give the judge some pause. We'll see how that works out, though. And now to a major interview with a juror in the trial of convicted wife killer Scott Peterson. Law and Crime's Angela Levy spoke with one of the jurors about Peterson's claim that a stealth juror tainted deliberations. Yeah, Brian, Scott Peterson is asking for a new trial based in part on a potential er issue with one of the jurors. But juror Mike Belmessieri says that more than 16 years later, he has no regrets about the verdict. He's where he deserves to be. He earned it. Mike Belmessieri is one of the 12 jurors who spent nine months listening to evidence in the trial of Scott Peterson. He says he went into the trial believing Peterson was innocent and was unaffected by the massive amount of publicity. Where Scott Peterson was concerned, yeah, there was no reason for me to believe he was guilty because I didn't know anything. I didn't pay any attention to any of it. 
But over the months, as prosecutors presented more evidence, Bel Messieri says a clear picture began to emerge of a man who wanted to be free of the responsibilities of a wife and baby. The bodies of Lacey and Connor Peterson were found a short distance from where Peterson had gone fishing in the San Francisco Bay on Christmas Eve 2002. Peterson used a small boat that day. It had been purchased two weeks prior. He committed a very heinous crime. And there's no doubt in my mind, by the way, that that's the case. Now, Peterson wants a new trial. He says juror Rochelle Neese, nicknamed Strawberry Shortcake by the media, lied on her juror questionnaire about being the victim of domestic violence and seeking a restraining order. Let's talk about uh, Strawberry Shortcake. Peterson claims Neese was a stealth juror who went into deliberations with a clear agenda to convict him. Bell Messieri says Nice had a strong opinion and was brought into the deliberations later as an alternate. She didn't in any way uh, influence anyone with her, her, her position. And uh, she finally, you know, hey, calm down. Let's talk about what we're doing. We need to start over. And Mike Belmessieri says that he was incredibly disappointed when he found out that Rochelle Neese had started writing to Scott Peterson in prison. He called it completely inappropriate. There's actually a status hearing for Scott Peterson's trial late next month. At that time, the attorneys on both sides are expected to discuss discovery issues. Brian. Thanks, Anjanette. Terry, does the conviction seem strong based on this juror's conviction that they got it right? It does seem strong, Brian, and I hope it holds up. They had a ton of evidence. They know that the body showed up not far from where he was, you know, that day fishing. And that's not just a coincidence. We had a dog who had tracking evidence. We had a hydrologist who is a water expert who said that Peterson dumped Connor's body from the fishing boat. So even if they have to do this over again, I think there is plenty of evidence. And that juror definitely sounded as though he thought that it was definitive and that all the other jurors were on the same page. So let's hope that it sticks if the evidence shows it. And clearly it looks Looks like the evidence shows that this should have been a conviction. Now, Gene, let's look at it on the other side. Does Belmaseri's words about uh, juror Nice strengthen any kind of argument for misconduct? Absolutely. And here's the thing: this strawberry shortcake, Miss Nice. Okay, that's a juror that could have been a holdout. That is a juror that could have said not guilty. They didn't meet their burden. So Scott Peterson, in that sense, was denied his due process rights to a fair trial. The other juror, Mr. Mike B, can't pronounce his last name, he may, the other jurors may feel like he did, but that one juror, Strawberry Shortcake, could have replaced somebody that could have said, you know what, they didn't meet their burden, and that's not fair. Yeah, it's not fair. You can't have your cake and eat it, too, even if it's a Strawberry Shortcake. <laughs> and Jeanette, does Bel Masiri believe Scott Peterson deserves a new trial? You know, I, I asked him that, and he actually said that's not up to him. He said that is up to the court. But sitting through all of that months of testimony, he believed that it all added up. All the pieces fit together that Scott Peterson planned this murder. All right, so if he, if he believes it all adds up, this might come down to an issue that we always talk about, uh, that it could just be harmless error. Because at the end of the day, if all of them believe that the evidence fit the facts and the facts fit a guilty verdict, maybe we don't see another, tr uh, another uh, trial. But we'll have to wait and see. Thank you, everyone. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, the former deputy on trial takes a stand in his own defense. But first, opening statements in the trial of an Iowa college student found murdered in a cornfield are set to next week. Everything you need to know after this break. A man accused of killing an Iowa college student is set to stand trial next week. Our own Anjanette Levy will be in Iowa for the trial and is here with what to expect. Brian Christian Bahena Rivera is charged with first degree murder in the killing of Molly Tibbetts. She was a college student from Iowa. And they say, the prosecutors say that Bahena Rivera led them to Tibbetts' body, but his attorneys say he's actually innocent. I received a call at home um, probably around 9.30ish at night from Sheriff Kriegel. Um, advised me that um, one of our deputies was looking into the uh, disappearance of a, of a young lady named Molly Tibbetts in Brooklyn. 
University of Iowa student Molly Tibbetts was dog sitting on July 18th, 2018, while her friends were out of town. The only thing really missing or out of place would have been her running shoes. Um, and we found out through some interviews that it was very common for her to go jogging in the evening. Officers say Tibbetts is last seen on surveillance video jogging as a black Chevrolet Malibu with chrome mirrors and door handles circles the area. Investigators pulled over a car matching that description and spoke with the driver, Christian Bahena Rivera. Police say Bahena Rivera agreed to take them to the body after an 11 hour interrogation. We had uh, Mr. Rivera um, exit my car and walked him back to where we had gone into the cornfield. We knew that we needed to kind of change our position a little bit. And once we, once we did, after that second set of instructions from him, she was found within a few minutes. Police say Rivera confessed to arguing with Molly Tibbetts. They say there was blood in the back of his car, but his lawyers say it didn't belong to Tibbetts. The officer who questioned Rivera failed to read Rivera his full Miranda rights the first time around, so the jury won't see some of that evidence. Bahena Rivera's lawyers say his statement isn't reliable because of the language barrier and because the interrogation went on so long. You saw signs that Mr. Bahena was tired on that video, right? Probably, yeah. You saw times where he actually fell asleep, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. And the judge in this case moved the trial an hour and 40 minutes away from where this crime actually took place because of so much pretrial publicity. Jury selection in the case is expected to take two days, and opening statements are set for May 19th. Brian? Thanks, Edgina. Back with us is former federal prosecutor Gene Rossi and Terry Austin. Gene, the defense is saying there was a language barrier in this 11-hour interrogation with Rivera, while the prosecution is saying they got a confession. How do you see this interrogation? It all depends on what the evidence is at a pretrial ruling. Uh, the, they're going to argue that it wasn't a voluntary statement and it wasn't knowing. And looking at that, maybe he was under fatigue. And, and so they have an argument based on language and also fatigue. And it could be a case where the judge may flip a coin, if you will, because that, that, would, that would obviously be grounds for keeping it out. The language, fatigue, uh, the time frame and how long the interrogation was, those are all certain elements to a false confession. We'll see how they plan that out. Terry, at the end of the day, though, Rivera led them to her body. Isn't that just a closed case? Mm -hmm. It seems like it's a case close to me as far as I'm concerned, Brian. I mean, obviously, that confession and that interrogation on 11 hours could be questioned. And really, the authorities should have looked at that a little bit better so that this individual wouldn't get away technically with murder because that's a real distinct possibility here. But the fact that he led them to the body, <clears throat> that means he was involved in the killing. It means he could have done the killing. And the evidence seems to point to the fact there was blood in the car that he did do the killing. So hopefully this evidence will be admitted and we'll be able to have some justice in this case. Yeah. Is he the principal person who committed this crime or an accomplice? I'm not quite sure. We'll see how it gets argued out. And Jeanette, why has this case received so much attention? Well, you had a young college student who just seems like the girl next door who goes out running and goes missing. So the entire community was out looking for her. So was her family. And a lot of people on the national level tried to make a lot of the, the fact that Bahena Rivera was an undocumented immigrant and was in this country potentially illegally. So he was living in Iowa, but they say he was undocumented. And some people really tried to use that for political advantage. And Molly Tibbetts's parents said they didn't want any part of that. They don't want her murder being used in that way. So that's part of the reason it got so much attention. So it's not just the law, but a bit of politics bringing this to the forefront. It makes sense. Let's check in with Jesse Weber, host of the law and crime show, Prime Crime, to see what he's working on this week. Hey, Brian. Yeah, it's the case that changed everything. Teenager Michelle Carter is charged with killing her boyfriend by pressuring him to commit suicide through phone conversations. Now, the text messages themselves are outrageous, but wait till you hear her police interview. She left out some pretty important details. Did he, did he tell you he was going to do that or anything like that? Um... She was talking about it for a while. To watch our breakdown of the conclusion of this arguably unprecedented case, tune in to Law and Crime. Thanks, Jesse. Coming up on Law and Crime Daily, a Florida deputy accused of planting drugs, an unsuspecting driver, takes the stand in his own defense. The direct examination on the other side of this break.
Welcome back. A former Florida deputy accused of planting drugs on unsuspecting motorists is taking the stand in his own defense. Zachary Wester is facing 67 charges, including racketeering, possession of a controlled substance, and false imprisonment. Prosecutors say Wester would ask to search a person's car during routine traffic stops and then place meth or other drugs, unlawfully sending them to jail. On the stand, Wester had a simple explanation for why narcotics and other paraphernalia were found in the back of his own patrol vehicle. There were plastic canisters. Those are what we refer to as evidence vials. Anytime you had a powder narcotic or if you had a crystallized narcotic, it would be appropriate to place that into the evidence vials, vials to preserve the integrity of the narcotics. The narcotics mainly had the appearance of methamphetamine and marijuana. And I was separating the narcotics, the contents from the bag, putting the narcotic, the suspected narcotics into the clear evidence vial. My plan was in one bag to put the suspected narcotics, in another bag put the paraphernalia so that the evidence custodian could dispose of those items. And I proceeded into the sheriff's office. And Wester gave the jury another simple explanation for why his body camera was turned off during the stop of a motorist he arrested for drug possession. The charges against the motorist were later dropped. Over investigator would arrive, um, it was customary and per policy to turn off any recording devices. And were you guys going to discuss something about Mr. Clinney? Yes. So the conversation that we were going to have about Mr. Clinney was possibly... Uh, what's the objection? Overruled. You can continue. Okay. So the conversation we were going to have about Mr. Clinney was possibly um, transitioning him to a confidential informant. And was Mr. Clinney ever made a confidential informant or that ever brought up with him? He was not. He was on active state probation, and it was my understanding it was very difficult to allow someone to be a confidential informant if you were on probation. When we come back, cross-examination. How will Wester hold up when it's the prosecution asking the questions? The fiery testimony ahead. Back now to Florida, where prosecutors had tough questions for a former deputy accused of planting drugs during traffic stops. Well, why weren't we able to see the first part of that stop? That's what I'm asking about. Right. Yes, sir. So I don't work for Axon. I'm not an Axon body camera technician. So all I can testify to is the facts of what took place in that particular incident, where it, it appeared to experience what we were taught in our training as a reset function and the body camera was unable to start recording. And as soon as it got to a spot to where the camera was rebooted and I could restart the video, I did that as soon as possible. And it so happened that that error occurred at the time that you would have first gotten in that car and first had the opportunity to see the syringe and the baggie. Isn't that right? I would disagree with that. That's not when the error occurred? I would disagree with that. Well, then why isn't it on the video? Mr. Williams, I've explained this to you three or four times now as far as why that is not on the video. When the prosecution put pressure on the defendant, Wester stood his ground, saying all of his searches were lawful. I did, and, and here's the thing. Every time I pulled someone over, if they said, oh, that's mom or that's dad's or that's my cousin's, there would never, I can't say never, the majority of the time, there would not be an arrest made in a narcotics possession case. Most of the time, they deny knowledge. So Mr. Williams, you're, you're presenting to this jury that in the first circuit where you work, that if someone says that they didn't know about the narcotics, you're just gonna drop the case on every single narcotics charge that comes on your desk? Sir, you know that's not what I'm saying. Uh, it sounds aware. to me that's what you're saying. Okay, well, thank you for your input. Now, that is what you're, is at issue in this case to this jury is to determine whether or not those drugs were really there or whether or not you put them there. You right. would agree that is the issue. Right, and I'm testifying to this jury today that the drugs were there. I did not put the narcotics there. All right, let's bring in Gene and Terry one last time. Gene, what did you make of Wester's explanation of the drugs in his vehicle? Oh, this is simple. He was suspended August 1st of 2018. He was suspended. Okay, they probably said you can't do your job anymore. This search of his car, I believe, was September 6th. 
Why in God's name is meth still in his car? There is no law enforcement reason for that meth to be there unless it had been there because he was planting it. That would be my argument to the jury. And this explanation, he was doing this chain of custody, preserving the integrity, that's baloney. When you seize the drugs from somebody during a car stop, you do a beeline to the police station and you put it in evidence and it's called chain of custody. And, and for him to have all that in his car, his explanation doesn't pass the laugh test. That's a big Achilles heel in his defense. Absolutely. Let's hope the prosecution is explaining it as clearly as you did. Terry, I don't know whether this was two grown men bickering or a cross-examination. Was a cross-examination effective here? I actually think it was effective. Yes, they were bickering, but this was the most arrogant, argumentative witness I've ever seen on the stand, actually. I mean, he was really being contrite with the prosecution. And while I think the prosecution should have limited the testimony, he should have said to the judge, listen, judge, he's not answering the question, make him answer the question, non-responsive, et cetera. I do think that the prosecution held his ground, and I think he made Wester look, uh, or the witness look, like he was arrogant and, and, and defensive. And I think the jury is not going to like him for that. So good job on the prosecution side. Yeah, definitely a lot of bad facts against Wester. We'll see how this plays out. Terry and Gene, thank you very much. And thank you for joining us here at Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.